Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest today is Aaron Sheely, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Oklahoma College of Law, and we will be discussing her paper, A Broken Windows Theory of Sexual Assault Enforcement. So welcome to the podcast, Aaron. Thanks, Brian. It's such a pleasure to have you on, and um, I've read your paper several times now uh, in various iterations and, and really uh, find it very extremely provocative and, and really interesting and compelling in, in a lot of ways. And I thought it would be helpful for listeners if we just started with the basics, right? And if, if you, you told people a little bit about what the, the broken windows theory of enforcement is for people who might not be familiar with it. Sure. So the original broken windows theory of um, criminal enforcement, generally speaking, was was developed in the 1980s by the criminologist James Q. Wilson. Um, and the idea was basically that if we try to police sort of the appearance of disorder in a community, then that will have what could sort of be described as a trickle up effect um, with respect to more serious disorder. So violent crime, property crime and so forth. Uh, the, the problem with how that was actually applied back during the 80s when it became used by um, New York City and a couple of other major U.S. cities um, to, to reduce their, their crime rates, it became somewhat abused by police officers, uh, particularly in connection with the Fourth Amendment rule in uh, Terry v. Ohio, which basically authorized stopped stop and frisks without probable cause um, police officers became very aggressive at policing lower income communities and making lots of arrests without probable cause for for crimes like loitering um sort of victimless low-level sorts of offenses that gave them an excuse to take people in and then try to find out more information about guns and, and drugs and so forth so the actual broken windows theory, I should say at the outset, should not be conflated with its um, enforcement or its application in the 1980s, which kind of went, um, went in the direction of excessive police involvement and I think abuse. So the basic core, when I, when I use broken windows in the paper, it's basically just the idea that there may be ways of getting at higher level sorts of disorder through um, policing smaller smaller level offenses that kind of um, add to the overall picture of disorder. And the context that I'm interested in in the paper is the relationship between low, lower level acts of sexual violence and more serious acts of rape. Okay, okay. So as I understand it then, the broken windows theory is basically a causal theory of the relationship between um, police enforcement of low level offenses and the prevention of more of more serious crime. And as you know, that there, there are concerns about kind of discretionary enforcement of these kinds of enforcement of low level offenses and whether there might be a discrimination element there. I kind of wanted to, to put a pin on that because I think maybe it's worth coming back to later. But, but first, I thought you, you had a really interesting observation about different ways in which the broken windows theory might potentially be effective. In other words, people often think of it as just a direct one-to-one -one relationship. But as you point out, you know, it could have the consequences that it produces could be viewed in different ways. And those different kinds of consequences might affect our assessment of whether or not we think it's a good policy approach to take to criminal enforcement. Yeah, so there are a number of possible connections between the appearance of order and kind of the actual case of order. And other scholars have, have developed this um, model. I don't want to take credit for developing the model, but to summarize, basically, um, it might be the case that if the appearance of order will actually lead to better order. And the example that's been given in the scholarship is a bank, for example. So um, the more secure people think banking institutions are, the more secure they in fact actually are. Um, there's another sort of weaker form of causation, 
which basically relates to the creation of norms, like using the law to sort of um, create established sets of views that then create their own order. So the classic example of that would be um, a clock that we use to define the official time for certain purposes. It's not that us all agree. It's not. It's not that the you know the whatever clock is being used to set everyone's iPhone is actually better or more useful than other clocks that are slightly off. It's just sort of the fact of agreeing on it that can be valuable. Um, and then you have the third case where it would actually be really bad if something had the appearance of being um, orderly and in fact wasn't. And so the example um, from the scholarship on that is a bridge. If it looks safe, but it's not, that's really bad. Um, yeah. So I, I did not kind of come up with that, that taxonomy myself, but it's, that was kind of my starting point when I was thinking about how this all might apply to sexual assault. Um, thinking about what are, what are the various ways in which policing lower level acts of violence against women might have an effect on more serious um, acts of violence. Okay, so maybe what you maybe what would be helpful would be if you to explain how those kind of three different paradigms um, have been discussed in relation to broken windows policing more generally, and then why you think sexual assault enforcement might be different or might require a different way of looking at those three paradigms. Sure. And first, I want to give credit. The, the bridge and the clock and the bank model um, come from the work of Professor Adam Samaha, whose work I was heavily drawing on when I um, was going through that taxonomy. Um, but yeah, so how do these apply to sexual assault? Okay, so what we know about broken windows in general, there is a lot of scholarship that suggests that the significant reduction in violent crime that it appears to have um, created in the 80s, believe 43 percent, roughly na nationwide reduction in violent crime at the same time as broken windows was being unfolded. There is um, a strong argument that a lot of that is just a reversion to the mean. In other words, um, there had been a significant crack epidemic in the early 80s, which eventually, through a number of different means, um, abated. And so there's some, some evidence that the strong causal sort of bank model view of broken windows is not actually supported by the evidence. Um, however, the most recent study, there was a 2015 meta-analysis conducted at Northeastern of a number of about 30 or so other, other long-term broken window studies, which suggests that it has a modest, um, statistically significant effect overall. So I call that the strong view of broken windows, the idea that there is some, even if modest, reduction in more serious offenses due to the um, policing of less serious offenses. So what that would look like then, um, uh, the, the less serious offenses here that I'm, I'm talking about are sexual, sexually assaultive street harassment of women. Mm -hmm. And I'll get in in a second, we might want to talk about what exactly I mean by that. Mm -hmm. But the, the strong broken windows theory would say, um, if we can reduce the number of acts of violence against women on the street that occur in a sexualized manner, we can get at more serious offenses, um, sexual assault and rape that occur elsewhere. In the, in the same way that the strong view of broken windows would say, if we arrest more people for vandalism and for breaking windows, we'll get fewer murder, fewer murders and fewer um, incidents of, of violent crime. So that would be the strong view of broken windows. If, that, if that's right, then that would be a significant advantage, even a, I would say even a modest reduction in rape or sexual assault would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. However, um, even if that's not true, even if all we get through um, policing of broken windows is just fewer broken windows. In the context of sexual assault, fewer broken windows is uniquely valuable. Um, what I mean by that is we have a massive problem with women under-reporting sexual offenses. Uh, the recent numbers from the DOJ, I think from 2014, say that only about 32% of sexual assault victims report the fact that they were assaulted. And one out of five of those give us their reason for not reporting. The fact that they don't think the system is going to take their, their, crime, their claims seriously. 
um, there's a significant amount of psych literature backing up the fact that institutional actors do not, in fact, necessarily take all forms of sexual assault um, accusation as, as seriously as they should, and that this has caused a significant deterrent effect for victims. So what I would describe as the weak version of broken windows theory um, would be that at a minimum, it can kind of change the norm about what offenses are worth reporting. In other words, if rape victims see that the system is taking their claims seriously, or if, if rape victims see that the system is taking seriously the claims of women who have been um, sexually victimized in a lower level kind of street harassment setting, then mm -hmm. my hope is that that will make them more likely to report. Mm -hmm. So I would say, which would still get a, give us um, lower levels of, hopefully lower levels of sexual assault, generally speaking, because we would at least have um, less of an under-reporting problem. So that's, that's the weak version, and I would say that that kind of corresponds to the, the clock model I was describing before, mm -hmm. where maybe one thing the law can do is just kind of change the norms that we're using so we can all get on the same page. That's, um, that, that would be what I would see the um, perhaps more likely but very important effect of what I'm proposing. Right, yeah, and one thing that really struck me powerfully about the comparison between the sort of traditional broken windows theory and the sexual assault specific theory that you propose is that you point out sort of implicitly in the paper that many of the offenses that are being policed in a traditional broken windows theory are kind of trivial offenses thing like things like you know, property crimes vandalism graffiti and so on, where it's like maybe ceteris paratus, people don't like it, and they'd rather not have it there, but it doesn't have a huge um, direct effect on their lives. Whereas in the case of, of sexual assault and sexual harassment, um, the, act, the activities that you're suggesting should be enforced more rigorously are, are actually themselves really harmful. To people in many different ways. And I was wondering if you could kind of like talk about that distinction a little bit more. Sure. So what I'm specifically proposing be um, not criminalized because these things are already criminalized, but actually pursued by law enforcement and prosecutors are um, episodes of street harassment that already rise to the level of assault or a similar offense under existing state criminal law. So, for example, the, um, the common law definition of assault, which is still the law in a number of states, um, such as Illinois, it's basically um, putting someone in apprehension, uh, immediate apprehension of unwanted touching. So you don't have to actually touch them. You just have to approach them in a way that makes them feel reasonably that they are about to be non-consensually touched. And so sexual assault would be a sexualized version of that. Um, and states that don't use the common law definition of assault have various other offenses. Um, menacing, I believe Ohio uses, has, has that offense on the books, which basically says um, it, it's illegal to knowingly cause another person to believe that they are about to cause physical harm. Um, there's, let's see, what are some other examples? Um, in New York, their forcible touching is an offense and attempted forcible touching is also an offense. So basically all, all these, these existing criminal laws that make it a crime to approach someone in such a way that makes them feel that they are about to be harmed or touched. And so what happens when we're talking about sexualized street harassment if you have someone come up to a woman, um, get up in her face, pursue her, walk down the street with her, make comments to the effect of, I would really like to you know, fill in the blank, grotesque sexual conduct. At those moments, first of all, she is quite reasonably in apprehension of being touched in a way that she does not want to be touched. Um, and with respect to the requirement that some of these statutes have, that there be some kind of harm, um, the basic reduction to sort of a vulnerable body and being reminded of one's sort of perpetual um, 
vulnerability to having sexual violence done to them while trying to go about one's day uh, walking to work or whatnot it's obviously fairly significant harm for that for that person mm -hmm. so what i propose is not that we criminalize speech which would have all sorts of first amendment problems but that we really try to look at what sorts of um, street harassment interactions actually meet the elements of one of these existing offenses and not all of them will um, a cat call by someone who's just standing in front of a building or whatever clearly clearly not but the cases that really do put someone put the victim in immediate apprehension of being touched against their will those those are fair game to be enforced under the existing law right so in other words what you're saying is there's a lot of criminal activity that's actually not being enforced and i i guess would it be your assessment that maybe when broken windows was implemented there was a focus on the kinds of property crimes that may or may not have a direct causal relationship with reducing more serious crime and a de-emphasis or a lack of emphasis on the kinds of sexualized assault crimes that you're proposing should be more of a focus of uh, criminal enforcement? Sure, I think, I think they were just interested in a different set of problems back in the 80s. They were, they were interested in getting drugs and illegal guns off the streets. And it is very easy if the underlying offense is something like loitering or vandalism um, where the police officer's observations alone create enough probable cause to bring someone in, um, as mm. opposed to the street harassment episodes I'm describing. They generally require a, a victim who is distressed enough by what happened to report it, unless, obviously, unless the police officer happens to be standing right there. Um, and even in that case, the, the victim may not be willing to participate in um, apprehension of the, of the offender. So I think it, it's not that I think in the 80s they didn't care about sexual assault. I think they were just trying to find an easier way to make arrests. And this is actually what I'm proposing is not a particularly easy way to make arrests because it, it requires, you know, it requires a victim who actually mm -hmm. is, um, feels strongly enough about what happened to report it and to, to give the evidence necessary to, to show probable cause. So I think they're, they're kind of apples and oranges situations. Right, right. Well, you've, you've talked about this a little bit already, uh, but I think you really get at something powerful in your paper about the real social costs associated with the kind of harassment that you're talking about. I was wondering, I, I think it's just important. Um, I would love it if you could sort of just remind people of how significant those social costs really are. Yeah, so there are some immediate pragmatic costs, and then there are some, I guess, what I would call normative costs. Um, pragmatically, by it's particularly in urban areas, for half the population to feel vulnerable, uncomfortable, endangered, sort of reduced to their own sexuality by going certain places at certain times of day, this actually is preventing 50% of the population from being as fully productive, um, as fully active consumers, um, as fully participatory members of society as the other 50%. So that's mm -hmm. just pragmatically bad um, in, in areas where people are driving more than walking, much less of a problem. But in areas where certain parts of the city at certain hours of the day are uncomfortable to be in, when the street is, when there's sort of a cost imposed on you're just deciding to run across the street at 2 a.m. to grab a bagel or something, um, there are actual economic as well as social um, costs to that. But I would say more importantly than that, the, what, what really links street harassment to the much more pervasive, much more serious problem of, of rape and serious sexual assault is that it all is, it participates in this sort of norm of def, what I call default access to a woman's body. I think the, the moments at which street harassment becomes the most frightening for a lot of women is when they try to ignore, they try to move on, 
or worse yet, they yell back at the harasser and are met with some sort of aggressive, frightening display of um, just anger and rage at not being able to engage sexually, even verbally, with a total stranger. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the core um, norms that, that goes into a lot of these cases of, um, of acquaintance rape, where the issue is you have two people who are drinking and um, there's no consent, but there's this sort of assumption that the woman is going to be sexually available in a way that will make the man continue even in the absence of consent. That mm -hmm. norm that norm of default access to a woman's body is, to me, um, so visible in street harassment settings. And it's, it's a reason why I think that um, looking at them as a proxy for this, um, the, the more serious problems is really so important. It's that norm that I think that we could work on changing by using existing criminal laws. So I, I think it's implicit in what you just said, but worth digging a little deeper into, uh, that you talk in your paper about the expressive function of, of criminal enforcement in relation to norm shifting. And, and, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your, your thoughts on that subject. Yeah, so the expressive theory of punishment, there, there are a couple of different theories of punishment which the law takes into account. Some of them come up with contradictory outcomes in certain cases. But the expressive theory is the idea that when we assign punishment for certain things, we are sending as a society a message to, to current and future offenders that their conduct is not acceptable. We are sending sort of a morally inflected message to the world that there are certain things about, um, there's just certain types of conduct our society won't tolerate. And we're sending messages, um, messages to the victims that if something has happened to you um, that has harmed you in a particular way, we are not okay with that and we're going to do something about it. So it's just the idea that the, there's a kind of a symbolic speech that is, uh, attaches to any criminal punishment. And so, the people, schol empirical scholars will argue about how powerful that expressive message is when it comes to actually changing behavior through changing norms. Because we know the criminal law shapes behavior by deterring cert certain types of conduct just because people don't want to be punished. But the way in which people actually do change their behavior, even when they don't feel punishment, fear punishment, due to the, the norm creating power of um, expressive criminal punishment, that is up in the air, but it, there have been a number of studies that have shown um, people's habits when it comes to cleaning up after their dogs, um, people's habits when it comes to certain traffic behavior, even in cases when they don't think they're likely to get caught, can be shaped or appear to be shaped by the, the simple fact of something having been declared criminal. So mm -hmm. here, the idea is we've got street harassment is almost never criminally punished and it is extremely pervasive. So the idea here would be that by actually taking people in when they have committed certain um, assaultive acts on, on women in the street, um, we might actually change the way in which people think behaving um, should be. Um, or certain things that may seem acceptable now might be less acceptable and the norm sort of in favor of allowing them would shift if, if we, allowed the criminal justice system to serve an expressive purpose in these cases. Right. Yeah. And that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me in the, in the sense that, you know, when we de-emphasize policing a particular kind of behavior, we signal something about how we as a society feel about that behavior, whether or not we explicitly mean to do that or not. Absolutely. Yeah, you make you make a really good point, actually, that, that bears repeating. It's not even just that we, the justice system makes statements when it does punish. The absence of punishment can send a message, too. And I think the numbers strongly suggest that the message being sent to victims of sexual assault is that these are not real crimes that are going to be taken seriously by the justice system. Right. So w one thing that struck me was that... <clears throat> In your paper, you focus on offenses that are criminally 
punishable, right? And your argument is that, or one of your arguments is that the police should more aggressively or at all punish or attempt to punish these kinds of criminal offenses. But it, it struck me that that actually taking people in, actually arresting people, is only one way that police go about enforcing order. And specifically, uh, my sense anyway, is that in a kind of a broken windows paradigm, there is this sort of idea that police should be policing order writ large, right? Whether or not that necessarily always means arresting people. So in, in a sense, I wonder whether there isn't a way in which the police could police harassment more broadly. And if, if they could, why don't they? Yeah, I, I certainly think that in situations where a woman is being harassed, actually, I don't even want to suggest that they don't in those cases. I strongly suspect that if someone were pursuing a victim down the street making grotesque sexual comments to her and a police officer happened to see it, mm. I think that probably they would do something. I, obviously, speaking in, in generalities, but I know I personally have had police officers come to my assistance in uncomfortable situations like that. Um, I think it's more just prosecutors are not really going to go after these cases for a number of reasons, some, some of which are, are valid because they have more serious crimes and so forth. Maybe they don't see what I think is the kind of serious societal effects of street mm -hmm. harassment in quite the same way I do. Um, but I would say that um, the, to the extent that police officers don't make it a priority, it's, it's because it's just not a priority among prosecutors. Um, yeah, so I do, I do think police officers can, and I, I think sometimes do, uh, make themselves present and available when, when victims are in these situations in public. I just think they're not, there's, taking it further than that is what's probably not going to happen. And I don't really think they seek this out as a concern or an mm. enforcement priority, but that probably also varies by the culture of specific departments and so forth. Right, right. I mean, do you have a sense that there's a norm in law enforcement of being concerned about street harassment and other forms of harassment and seeing it as a priority or do you have a sense that that's something that's de-emphasized as a sort of way of thinking about what matters or what to prioritize in, in terms of sort of policing order in the community? Well, the prosecutors I've spoken to about this, their, their responses tend to fall into one of two categories. Uh, one is sort of what I, what I said, alluded to a second ago, that, yeah, it's bad, it's annoying, but we have actual rapes and murders and all these more significant things on you know on our agenda we have um sort of state level policies about prioritizing drug offenses or specific gangs in general just there's other more important stuff and so part of my part of my writing the paper i would say the paper is to some extent directed at prosecutors sort of trying to make the case for why um the street harassment stuff is important not just because of street harassment qua street harassment but because of the relationship between street harassment and rape mm. and the, that thinking, reconceiving it that way might make it more appealing for prosecutors to kind of bump that up on their list of enforcement priorities, which would then, I think, make police officers more likely to take it seriously. Mm. Um, so that's like one category. The second category of responses I've gotten from actual law enforcement I've spoken to about this is, well, that, that's going to be a really big evidentiary problem. Um, and I agree, in a lot of cases, these things happen so quickly, sometimes you have a moment where you're flustered, like recovering, like expecting a, a victim to immediately seek out a police officer and direct them back to, to her. Um, that's, yeah, that's asking a lot. And in reality, probably that won't happen very often. Um, but what I say when, when they make that argument is that, well, we know that it has happened sometimes. Um, in, D in D.C., for example, a few years ago, we had the Washington, D.C. bicycle groper who basically just rode around northwest D.C. and would grab someone's breast when passing her on the street. And finally, one of his victims just was absolutely not having it and mm. waged a, um, a, 
a social media war essentially against the DC Metro police to really make an effort to find this guy and they eventually did. So I think it would be one of those things where it would probably only get enforced when you actually had the right evidentiary pieces in place, which might require a certain amount of luck and um, victims that really wanted to, to kind of pursue it. But I don't think that's a reason not to do it either, simply because we can often get a lot of bank fraud enforcement back by having rare but well-publicized enforcement um, whenever the evidence actually allows it. And I guess the, the final thing I would say on that point is um, one of the reasons I think it's so important to go after these types of crimes is we do have a really serious evidentiary issue with more serious forms of, of sexual assault when we're having a hard time, we have, we have a hard time prosecuting when we don't know what happens behind closed doors. We don't know exactly without witnesses, in many cases, what happens between two people. And that just makes it hard to get um, a case proven up beyond a reasonable doubt. So mm -hmm. I would say that especially because we have these evidentiary holes when we're trying to go after the higher level stuff, uh, at least in these street harassment cases, they're happening in broad daylight often, they're happening with witnesses. So I don't think that should be an obstacle to at least experimenting with it. But I think, um, I, I think those are probably the reasons why right now it has not been very heavily enforced. Right. Right. I mean, it did strike me that a, a big piece of the argument that you were making was that if we want a culture of sexual consent, we have to think holistically about how to create such a culture. And, and maybe the approach you're describing is one way among many of encouraging a new norm of being sensitive to consent. Yeah, that's, I think in a nutshell, that's absolutely the, the project of this paper. It's not necessarily trying to suggest a particular causal effect under any particular set of circumstances, but it is showing that there's an awful lot of evidence that these behaviors are related to a much more pervasive problem and that the, system, <clears throat> the criminal justice system itself, to the extent that it doesn't do anything about it, is still kind of contributing to the overall problem. Which yeah. um, I think I, I think right now we can we can agree that the the overall problem does exist. It's more of just figuring out creative ways to try to attack it. Right. So you you acknowledged earlier that there are some kind of discrimination concerns with relation to the actual implementation of the broken windows theory and policing in the eighties and nineties and today as well. Um, I was wondering if you could address just briefly, um, you know, how you would respond to people who might be concerned about similar problems in relation to the kind of enforcement you're suggesting. Yeah, I, I really do think that the role of the victim in all of this plays a central uh, or plays a central role. The, the, you're not going to be able to make an arrest unless you have a victim who wants to testify. And I would say most of the time, if you have a victim making a complaint, there that is enough to constitute probable cause. Um, do I think that there would be cases where certain victims were taken more seriously than others? Do I worry that some of these cases might break down around racial lines? I absolutely do. Um, the, the system's better treatment of white victims as opposed to victims of color is unfortunately a pervasive problem in all areas of criminal law. So this would have that risk almost like the existence of criminal justice has that risk as long as as long as people and, and actors within the system are, still behave in a biased fashion but i would say that the the massive lack of protection for victims of sexualized interaction in the streets is important enough that we need to think about how to deal with it um hopefully in a way that is not uh, does not have the same problems that the the 80s version of this did. So do I think it's a risk? Absolutely. I think when I when I set out to write this paper, that was my biggest concern about it. But mm -hmm. I do think there's a built-in safety valve simply because an, an officer making a unilateral decision to arrest someone just isn't a risk here because of the, the elements of, of the offense. Right, right. Now that makes a lot of sense that, you know, the higher 
the higher burden of evidentiary proof from the law enforcement perspective means that it'll be that much harder to enforce in a discriminatory fashion because generating the evidence to do so will be that much harder as well. Exactly. Yeah, I, I almost say that the, the two sort of problems with the, um, the idea cancel each other out to some extent. It is, there are big evidentiary problems, which means it can't be all effective all the time, but I actually wouldn't want it to be effective all the time for precisely the reasons you suggest, that having a very easy way to arrest people all the time is not something we want to give our police officers. <laughs> Great. Well, in, in closing, Erin, I, I was wondering if you were interested in sharing any thoughts about where you're taking this project going forward, because it seems like it incorporates a lot of your previous research, and I wonder how you see it within your long-term research project. Yeah, I actually, it, it surfaces in the work in progress I've got going right now, which is um, already up on SSRM, it's forthcoming from the um, UNC Law Review, which actually deals with corporate criminal mens rea, which sounds mm -hmm. like a very strange leap, but the I'll, I'll sort of summarize the part of that paper that relates to this broken window stuff. Um, under the current standard for holding a corporation criminally liable for the the crimes of its employees, there is a requirement that the corporate, that the employee have been acting at least in part to benefit the corporation, which basically means cases like um, U.S. Gymnastics or the Weinstein Company, cases where you have some kind of institutional support for um, an employee in a position of power sexually victimizing people through his employment. Those cases can't be criminally prosecuted. I mean, the, the employee can be criminally prosecuted, but the company can't be. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of using a little bit of the same methodology in terms of looking at what is the actual nature of the harm that's being imposed by, in the case of street harassment, the street harasser, in the case of um, corporate sexual acts, the corporation itself. How do we look at these situations from the perspective of the victim and articulate how the criminal laws have been engaged by these um, potential defendants. So taking it out of the, uh, off, off the street corner into the, into the boardroom maybe to some extent, but similar, I, 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 I see this as kind of the next step in that, on that train of, yeah. of thinking. Yeah, out of the streets and into the boardroom. Yes, that can that could be a pull quote for the the, the eight hundred word write up of this. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Aaron, it's been a real pleasure talking to you about this paper and I, I hope we can do this again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Brian.